Disguised Weapons Ever since the invention of firearms, weapons designers have constantly sought to improve them. Some focused on increasing the range or accuracy, while others wanted to increase the rate of fire or the ammunition capacity. This has led to the creation of iconic and infamous weapons that can lay down a blistering rate of fire to mow down scores of enemies or deliver pinpoint accurate shots from unbelievable distances. There are some firearm designs that went a different route, though. Made with concealment in mind, here are a few examples of seemingly mundane objects that hold a deadly secret. The Briefcase Gun in the 1970s, a spree of terrorist attacks led to the need for protection among politicians and other prominent members of society. Seeing an opportunity, the German firearm manufacturer Heckler & Koch began development on a way for the bodyguards of these individuals to carry extra firepower in a concealed package. Known as the Special Koffer or Special Case, the briefcase gun is a nondescript case that would not seem out of place in any office or government building. Inside, however, instead of containing paperwork, it held an HK MP5 submachine gun. Already a compact weapon, the MP5 was and still is a mainstay of SWAT teams and other forces around the world who engage in close quarter fighting. With the addition of the Special Koffer, the versatility of the weapon only increased. The briefcase gun consisted of an aluminum case coated in a black plastic finish and weighed in at 3.3 pounds without the firearm. At one side is an opening for the muzzle of an MP5K, the shortest variant of the MP5. The gun would be mounted to the case on a claw hook and connected to the trigger with a series of metal actuators. To fire the weapon, the case's trigger was located on the carrying handle. There was no extractor for empty shell casings. The expended round simply fell to the bottom of the case. H&K also created a Special Tasha, or Special Bag, which was disguised as a leather carrying case which had an opening, allowing the user to insert his hand to more effectively operate the weapon inside, and does not have an integrated trigger on the handle. To use, the operator needed to reach inside the case to operate the gun manually. The briefcase gun is easily concealed for use by the bodyguards of VIPs. Should the need arise, they can deliver a stream of firepower without having to draw a weapon, enabling them to respond quickly to any threat. There are some drawbacks, however. Aiming the case is difficult, since bringing it to a standard firing position is awkward at best and defeats the purpose of already available firepower, and would only be effective at very close range. There are also no controls over the firearm other than the trigger. To access the weapon, such as to reload, the case would have to be opened and the weapon removed before reloading, clearing jams, or any other function. This can be done easily by simply opening the case with a pair of stainless steel clasps, though this costs precious seconds when time is the most critical. H&K sold thousands of these cases, with a very large number being sent to the Middle East. During the 2003 invasion of Iraq, American forces found 24 of them, though they had not been used. In the Soviet Union, another briefcase gun was created, which has a similar but much simpler design than the H&K version. The carrying handle is attached directly to the weapon, in this case an AKS-74U. When activated, the rest of the case simply drops away, leaving the handle and the weapon still in the grasp of the user, and it's ready to fire in the standard way. The handle can be detached easily, so the sights will not be obstructed when firing. Known as the Operational Briefcase, the system was intended for use by KGB officers who would need additional firepower while not openly carrying an assault rifle. Here, check this out, an S-tier MP5 SMG. It's perfect for close quarter combat, and it's a favorite of private security mercs worldwide. But would this thing be any good today, you know, since no one uses briefcases anymore unless, uh, I don't know, you're an old school Wall Street guy? Hey, this video is sponsored by MyHeritage. They are the leader for family history research and DNA testing. I think over 90 million people have trusted MyHeritage with their information, you know, building out their family trees and learning about their history. Now, personally, I found that like locating history on your family tree can be pretty rough. It's pretty difficult digging through old books, finding old photo albums and locating the correct oh. photos. It's a huge hassle, but to be honest, it's way more work than I'm willing to do. This is kind of a project I've started and stopped so many times that I've lost count. 
I do love that my heritage sort of allows me to plug in a little data and it finds all the relevant info so I don't have to put it off anymore. It digs up more information than I could ever find myself. And using this service is pretty easy. Check it out. The thing I really appreciate about this service the most is like I can search over 19 billion historical documents if I really wanted to. That's certainly more than I have in like all the boxes upstairs that I don't want to open. And on top of that, using that instant discovery feature uh, is pretty easy and it like showcases more family tree than I ever knew existed. I love history and I love learning more about my own history. My heritage just makes it even better. To find out about your own family tree, sign up for a 14 day free trial and open up your own box of family photos without having to go into the attic. Fountain Pen Guns The pen is mightier than the sword and some took this to heart. As far back as the 19th century with the introduction of self-contained metallic cartridges, all manner of firearms were constructed around everyday objects, such as umbrellas, canes, watches, and a host of other items. One of the most popular items that contained a hidden firearm were simple fountain pens. In the 20th century, pens were commonly used as a way for someone, usually a spy or some other type of undercover agent, to carry a weapon without arousing suspicion. There are many different models of pen guns with their own unique characteristics, but they do share some common traits. They're usually small in caliber since the pen gun has to be able to pass itself off as a regular pen, so large cartridges such as rifle rounds and shotgun shells are unfeasible. One antique pen gun in possession of the FBI was chambered for 38 short Colt, an obsolete black powder cartridge, while others are chambered in 22, a 32 ACP, and a number of others. Also, due to the size restraints, these guns are single shot only. As they often lack an extractor or ejector, the pen must be broken open or even disassembled, the spent casing manually removed, a new cartridge placed, and the weapon reassembled before being able to fire again. Since pen guns are designed for concealability rather than effectiveness, and they come with serious drawbacks as a weapon. Apart from the fact that they're only single shot, another issue is their range and accuracy, or more specifically, the lack of any. Because it's the length of a regular pen, the gun's barrel is small. Since the expanding gases from the cartridge don't have time to build up before the bullet exits the barrel, the projectile has a low muzzle velocity, regardless of its caliber. Accuracy also suffers as a result of this, with one source stating that hitting anything further away than 20 feet with any precision would be next to impossible. Overall, pen guns are useless in a protracted firefight, or any altercation for that matter where the enemy is likely to shoot back. They're best used clandestinely, able to deliver a one-off shot at near point-blank range to unsuspecting targets that believe the wielder is unarmed. This may work for assassinations or as a self-defense tool, but otherwise pen guns are more at home on the big screen or as a novelty piece for firearm enthusiasts. Cane Guns and Poacher's Guns for those who want concealed firepower with a little more heft than a pen could provide, an alternative in the form of a cane gun was available. Housed around a gentleman's walking stick, they can be chambered with more powerful rounds, such as rifle rounds and shotgun shells. These are very rudimentary weapons, essentially just a barrel, a trigger, and simple manual ejectors for the spent casing and rarely have other features such as a sight. These are intended as self-defense weapons, so a gentleman can defend himself against would-be attackers at all times, but are more often novelty pieces for eccentric collectors. They are somewhat difficult to produce compared to dedicated firearms due to the engineering required to make the gun usable, while also being able to pass itself off as an ordinary cane and their use was often relegated to the upper classes. Similar to and often confused with cane guns are poacher's guns, foldable firearms designed for those who chose to ignore hunting laws. They were common in Great Britain during the early 20th century, though they were often manufactured in other countries, particularly Belgium. Among the most common were single-shot break-open firearms, chambered in 410, and were available in one or two barrels. The buttstock would have large cutaways 
and the mechanisms are rudimentary, all in an effort to save weight and space. Weighing in at a mere three and a half pounds, about the same as a large pistol, it was easy to hide under a coat, which allowed a poacher to amble around the countryside seemingly unarmed. If the opportunity arose, the weapon could be unfolded and game could be harvested, with complete disregard for a landowner's property. Obviously, these guns weren't advertised as poacher's guns. Instead, they were portrayed as a simple firearm for hunting rabbits and other small game, or as a starter weapon for a boy to practice his skills with. They were often unmarked and were sold without a company name, serial number, or any other identifying marking, advertised simply as single folding guns. Poacher's guns were also inexpensive. In a 1912 catalog, they started at one and a half pounds, about 123 pounds or $150 in today's money, making them affordable to the lower classes of society. Due to legislation regarding firearms, self-defense, and hunting, both cane guns and poacher's guns are rare, found mostly in private collections, as museum pieces, or gathering dust in a forgotten corner of an attic. The Glove Gun during the Second World War, the race was on for weapons designers to create more deadly firearms that would give their side an edge against the opposition. While no doubt creative, there were some attempts that perhaps were best left on the drawing board. Patented in 1944, the Sedgley OSS-38 was designed for the Office of Naval Intelligence by Stanley Haight and was designated as the hand-firing mechanism Mark II. The mechanism is a single-shot, break-open firearm that chambers a single 38 round. The entire apparatus would be mounted on the back of a regular leather work glove. The weapon is fired by a plunger parallel to the 3-inch barrel. To fire the weapon, the user would simply make a fist and punch the intended target, delivering a single devastating blow. It could be activated by using the opposite hand, though this places the user's fingers dangerously close to the business end of the firearm. A second shot required the user to break open the piece, remove the empty cartridge manually, load a new one, and then close the weapon. If all else fails, the wielder also has a solid piece of steel on his fist to bludgeon the victim with. This essentially was intended to be sent to the Pacific Theater, for use by troops who were fighting the Japanese. Unlike most other disguised weapons, the glove gun was not designed for assassinations. Obviously, concealment is next to impossible unless the user is wearing exceptionally long sleeves and keeps their hands at their sides at all times. Instead, the gun glove was a last resort weapon. The intention would be to issue it to troops who, in theory, would have a weapon on hand literally at all times. Should the soldier be caught off guard without his regular weapon, he would still have a chance of fighting back, should he be captured. When the potential prisoner is being checked before being taken captive, a single punch to the head would give him a chance to escape. The weapon was mounted on the back of the glove rather than the front, so that the user still had full use of his hands for his normal duties, without getting in the way. There are some drawbacks to this weapon. The range was point blank, literally. The target must be within arm's reach for it to work. Should the intended victim simply see the punching coming and step back, the weapon becomes useless. Furthermore, since it was designed as a last chance weapon for those being captured, it only has one round. Should there be another enemy soldier covering them, there's no chance of reloading for another shot, no matter what the distance. Finally, the weapon has a safety catch in order to prevent accidental discharges. This would have to be deactivated before use, otherwise the user will simply be punching an armed captor with no extra effect. Information about the use of the glove gun is virtually non-existent. Though there are some indications that some found their way into the hands of naval construction battalions or Seabees. It's unknown how many were made, with estimates ranging from 50 to about 200. There are no recorded cases of it actually being used in combat, and it's gone down in history as a creative piece of military hardware that has limited applications and has more impact in Hollywood than on the battlefield. Would you want to get hit by this thing? Man, I know I wouldn't want to. And did you know this glove made a cameo in Quentin Tarantino's Inglorious Bastards? Yeah, in the movie, it was used by one of them during their mission to kill the bad guys. The UC-9 Submachine Gun As a rule, submachine guns are designed to provide compact firepower in a compact frame. Not content with simply making a smaller weapon, a gunsmith, Utah Connor, took a different path to create a concealable firearm. 
The UC-9, also known as the DEB-M21, after David E. Boatman, a collaborator on the project, is functionally an Uzi submachine gun. Chambered for 9mm parabellum and with a cyclic rate of fire of between 700 and 900 rounds per minute, fed from a 32-round magazine, and with some minor modifications to the internal workings, it's identical to the more famous counterpart. Already a compact and relatively easily concealed weapon, the UC-9 takes concealability one step further. While most foldable weapons feature a simple folding stock to save space, the UC-9 folds entirely in half. This allows it to collapse into a small, easily carried box that looks nothing like a firearm. When needed, the weapon can be unfolded to its full length, then the magazine well pistol grip dropped into position and the charging handle pulled to cock the weapon and it was ready to fire, the whole process taking only a few seconds. The weapon is uncocked and has no round in the chamber while folded, making it safe to transport without the risk of an accidental discharge. In order to help the UC-9 blend in further, the outer shell of the weapon was disguised to look like a portable stereo from the 1980s, known as a boombox, and even included a large carrying handle and a telescopic antenna to complete the illusion. Connor made nine complete guns together with about 100 receivers before the Hughes Act took effect in 1986, making the creation of new fully automatic firearms for civilians in the U.S. illegal. After his death, the extra receivers were transferred to Michael Shine, who updated the design, refining the internal workings into a more efficient pattern from the proof of concept created by Connor. Shine also removed the boombox exterior, since by the time he was able to produce his version of the weapon, this technology was woefully outdated and would only serve to draw more attention. Instead, the folded-up UC-9 resembles a nondescript carrying case that can blend in virtually anywhere. Because only a few of the weapons were made before production ended, as well as the myriad of legal restrictions on automatic weapons, the few dozen UC-9s on the market today fetch a hefty price at over 12 grand apiece. Though novel in its design, the idea of a foldable concealed firearm of this type never caught on, and the project is seen as a novelty of the firearms world. So, the UC-9 SMG had an appearance in the 1990 movie RoboCop 2. This seemingly harmless-looking gun has its charging handle dangerously close to the muzzle. This design could blow your fingers off, man. The shooter's hand is right next to the muzzle when you charge it. And speaking of dangerous… KGB Poison Guns On September 7, 1978, Bulgarian playwright and defector Georgi Markov was waiting for a bus at Waterloo Bridge in London when he felt a sharp pain in the back of his right thigh. Turning quickly, he saw a man picking up an umbrella, who apologized for poking him in the leg with it, before hurrying across the street to a waiting taxi. Shortly after, Markov developed a high fever, had difficulty speaking, and increased blood pressure. He was rushed to the hospital and died four days later. A post-mortem analysis discovered a 1.5mm sphere made from iridium and platinum, with a pair of holes drilled into it forming a well. Though it cannot be confirmed, it was deduced that the well probably contained ricin, a deadly poison, and the pellet coated with wax, which kept the toxin in place, which melted at body temperature, releasing the ricin. Further examination of Markov's clothing shed some light on the murder weapon. Since the pellet was fired at point-blank range, a combustible propellant such as gunpowder would leave some trace of burn material, which was not found. It was likely that the weapon used was a pneumatic pellet gun disguised as a common umbrella, the propulsion provided by a CO2 canister. In all likelihood, the culprit was the Bulgarian State Security Service, who acted in corroboration with the Soviet KGB. Markov was an outspoken critic of Bulgaria's communist regime and was a regular contributor to Radio Free Europe which sought to undermine communist governments. Adding credence to this claim was an attempted assassination of another Bulgarian defector, Vladimir Kostov. Kostov was living in Paris and was also struck in the leg by a small pellet, which exhibited the same symptoms, though he did manage to recover. This wasn't the only time poison guns were used to rid communist governments of undesirables. In the late 1950s, the KGB would authorize the assassination of two Ukrainian nationalists living abroad. 
In 1957, Lev Rebet, former leader of the Ukrainian government, collapsed in his Munich office. The diagnosis of his death was a heart attack. Two years later, Stefan Bandera, a Ukrainian resistance leader and anti-communist, likewise collapsed in a Munich street. His death, however, was attributed to acute cyanide poisoning. The exact cause of these deaths and their connection would not become clear until 1961, when the assassin, Bodhan Stashinsky, defected to West Berlin. He revealed his reasoning behind the killings as well as the means. Both men were killed by the use of poison mist guns, which operate on the same principle as a perfume atomizer, similar to a common spray bottle. These metal tubes would contain cyanide, which would be sprayed into the face of the target, who would inhale the gas and then collapse, dying of an apparent heart attack. This is exactly what happened to Lev Rabat, who was assassinated with a single-barrel design of the weapon. Bandera would be killed with a refined version of the mist gun, which contained two barrels. Stashinsky activated both barrels of cyanide into Bandera's face, but due to the high concentration of poison, the chemical was detected, ruling out natural causes as a means of death. While the weapons do not hide in plain sight as well as a pellet gun umbrella, they're small enough that they could be hidden in a folded up newspaper or other inconspicuous object. Also, unlike conventional firearms that make a loud bang when fired, these weapons are nearly silent, which enables an assassin to poison his target without drawing undue attention, a vital component of clandestine operations. While technically not firearms, as they don't use a combustible powder to propel their payload, these devices are no less deadly to those unfortunate enough to encounter them. Yeah, after learning about that KGB poison gun, it's kind of like jumping into a real-life James Bond movie. All these covert weapons hidden in everyday objects, they kind of blur the line between spy movies and the realities of clandestine warfare. In the world of espionage, danger lurks around every corner. The X-Ray Camera Gun Sometimes hidden weapons are not designed, but rather improvised for nefarious purposes. In 1946, Pearl Lusk, who had recently moved to New York City, was approached by a man named Alan LaRue, an insurance adjuster who asked the recently unemployed woman to follow a suspected jewel thief. Agreeing, LaRue provided Lusk with what he called an X-ray camera, which would be able to detect any stolen jewelry on the suspected thief. The camera was itself wrapped in a green and red package, resembling a Christmas present. On New Year's Eve, Lusk found her target, Olga Trapani Rocco, near the Times Square station. As per LaRue's instruction, she aimed the shutter of the camera low at Rocco's waist, the location the suspected stolen jewels would be found. When she pulled the trip wire to activate the camera, a loud explosion was heard. Rocco fell to the ground screaming. Police were quickly on the scene, and Rocco was rushed to the hospital where her leg was amputated, though she did survive. An investigation revealed that the X-ray camera contained a hidden shotgun. Lusk was taken into custody, and it soon transpired that Alan LaRue was actually Alphonse Rocco, Olga's husband, whose marriage had been annulled two months prior to the incident. He'd been threatening his ex-wife since their split, requiring Olga to seek police protection. After the shooting, a manhunt for Rocco ensued. They eventually caught up with him in upstate New York, and after a brief shootout, he was killed by police. For her part in the shooting, Pearl Lusk would be released from custody. And incidentally, she and Olga Trapani would become friends, keeping in touch for many years afterwards. Throughout history, there are numerous examples of those who used ingenious means to baffle prying eyes and hide deadly weapons in plain sight. So, there's many examples of weapons hidden in plain sight. I mean, they're kind of ingenious, right? But if you were going to rank these guns, which one do you think is the best? I think the X-ray gun is definitely S-tier. To find out about your own family tree, sign up for a 14-day free trial and open up your own box of family photos without having to go into the attic.